number of you have heard, uh, we have a very exciting story to tell you, and we'll do that right after our first couple of songs. So we want to make sure everybody out here, we have been blessed, and I'm so excited to share it with you. But in the meanwhile, even without all that good news, it would be a great day, because today we get together and we remind each other that He is alive, and that has changed absolutely everything. Good morning. Good morning. Can you stand with us as we begin this morning? Beautiful one, what a wonderful singer, what a wonderful God that we serve.
even though he knows the things that we hold secret, that we hold in those dark places, and he loves us still, and he still sent his son to die for us. Let's pray to Heavenly Father, Lord, we are thankful for that love that you give us, for knowing us, knowing all of our inner secrets, knowing all of all about us, and yet, Lord, you still love us. You still desire to have a relationship with us, to bring us into your family, and we are so thankful for that. And Lord, today as we, we're here, Lord, hear our praise, hear our worship for you, because you are a mighty and a wonderful and a powerful God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Greet your neighbor around this morning, you being seated. <laughs> the first 
first payment will be $90,000. And I thought, that's incredible. Do you remember when the deer came in this building? <laughs> I told you there was a deer. That helped me get the deer out of the building, and I ran out and I said, did you see it? Did you see it? And she said, see what? <laughs> That's the way I feel like now. You know, I'm thinking, I'll feel better when there's a check in the office. But anyway, he went on to say that uh, he was writing out a number of checks. He was sending out a $100,000 check to a number of individuals. So I hope you were really nice to him at school. <laughs> But he went to school here, and again, like I said, was not a part of our community for all those years. I had made a contribution to the community building, so we did still have some connections. Uh, somebody was kind and gracious to the family. Uh, not sure why this gentleman said, I believe he wants to do this to honor his parents. He said, we're not sure yet, but we think the estate is valued at least to the number of $1.8 million. Those properties he had around town were absolutely packed clear to the top with antiques. And that's why it's taken so long. So, through no work of ours, no conniving, uh, no being nice to the little old lady who's getting ready to die, uh, nothing like that. It's simply something that the Lord put on his heart and mind. If you haven't done the math already, by the time they take the, the fees out for, for doing all the work that needs to be done, the church will receive something near $250,000. Can you believe that? Well, that is a great introduction for looking at our prayer list. I do have this picture up here, the one that was in the obituary. We'll post it up when we know for sure the check has come. <laughs> Just in case it doesn't come, Beth and I will be leaving for an extended <laughs> vacation. But we've received communications and relatedness. Obviously very legitimate. But we do have some prayer requests we'd like to share with you. I'll let you read the announcements. You can see all those are on there. May 3rd being the big date. It's our business meeting. So we want to make sure you see that. But the rest of them will let you read. I want to make sure that you're up to date on a couple of things. We have Dave Fincher scheduled for gallbladder surgery. Now we're not really sure because it sort of depends on the numbers when you're taking blood thinners. They've got to get that all right. He really had a difficult week with a lot of pain. Uh, they've got him up right now at uh, Lutheran Hospital in Fort Wayne in room 444. Uh, he's anticipating surgery perhaps today as soon as that is safe to do. So he, uh, we saw him yesterday and he pointed to something up on the board, you know. He said, you see that stuff right there? He says, that's really good stuff. <laughs> he says, I'm feeling great. So I should have asked what he thought about all of you because I'm sure I could have gotten a very full report. But he was really doing well and was confident, you know, that the Lord was uh, really managing everything. But please pray for Dave Fincher and, of course, for Linda. Steve Roller is a, uh, would be the son to Dick Roller. And if you know Dick and Shannon, he has, he has some very critical health concerns, so if you'd be praying for him, he was added to our list. A quick update, Roger Gearhart, last I heard, he was on the way up. That was Friday, is he still on the way up? I'm sorry? Still in intensive care, but continues to recover. Uh, Mary Kate Town had shoulder surgery. And Philip Hauser, Phil, Phyllis Hauser is going to have her reports given to her this week. And you go down through the list, all of those that you can see are matters of people we know or know of, and they're all very serious health situations. Tom Gardner did have his surgery, and uh, the biggest portion of the kidney stone was removed, and the rest of it seems to be coming along all right. 
I'd like to have you add one more name. It's an interesting spelling to Carly. It's K-A-R-H-L-I. Carly Wilson. This is an 18-year-old sister of um, Cheryl Gearhart's co-worker, 18-year-old young lady, recovering from an open heart surgery, and it uh, did not go as expected uh, or as hoped, and there's another surgery scheduled. So you can imagine that it must be a very serious issue. Carly Wilson. All right, let's pray together. Father, we're very thankful for the wonderful news uh, concerning the generosity of this man. And we thank you for the ministry this church has had now, literally through the centuries. At least two of those and our third. Lord, we're so thankful for your generosity because there's no doubt that you did this for us because you have plans for us to broaden and deepen our ministry, especially to young people. Father, I thank you for the most important piece of good news, as we've already said, and that is that our sins are forgiven because Christ died for us, was buried, and of course today we come to celebrate his resurrection. And Lord, we know that he did not just come back to life as a man, but indeed now he is for all of heaven to see, the King of kings, the, the Lord of lords, the high priest who has taken care of all of our sin. Father, we thank you too for these who are on our list. Father, we understand that there are times when much more is being accomplished than we can see. All we can see is the discomfort and the, the pain. And Lord, we know that there are times when that is a part of the, the, the tools you use for a more important procedure where you're working in the soul and in the heart. So Lord, we understand that with these individuals, but Lord, we do ask that you would be with Steve Roller because of his serious situation and be with Dick and Shannon as they uh, minister and care for their son. Lord, we think about Carly and we ask, of course, that not only would this heart surgery be successful or the surgery be successful, but Lord, through this, she'd, she'd be confronted with uh, wonderful truth that it makes a difference what Jesus has done. And Lord, we think of Dave and we know that uh, for Dave Fincher that today or perhaps tomorrow that the surgery is scheduled for as soon as it is safe. And Lord, we ask it be a successful surgery uh, for his gallbladder and that this will be the beginning of being able to get back to feeling better. Father, we ask for your blessing on all of our teachers, that you would encourage and teach them as they teach their students. And we ask for this as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And if you stand with us again, Bruce used the illustration a few weeks ago of um, the same sun that melts the wax, hardens the clay. And uh, every time we hear the gospel, every time we experience the grace of God, when we fail, when we go through a trial, whatever, whatever it is, when we experience the gospel, when we experience the grace of God, we have to continuously let it melt us and mold us and not become hardened to it, not to be molded by our Savior. And um, so this next song, consume me from the inside out, consume me so that every, every moment of every day, it starts with God. It begins with His love for us. And sue me from the inside out.
song, you can move those chairs back. The last song this morning, In the Secret and the Quiet Place. And um, as we go through our life, when we, when we realize the gospel, when we put that first, when we put the grace and mercy of God first um, in everything that we do, um, that's the race that we live. That's, that's, the, that's the goal of our life, is to share that with everyone around us, to experience ourselves and to share with those around us. The last song this morning, In the Secret in the Quiet Place. Even when we think he's not there, he is, and we can trust him.
two of our own young people uh, preparing for baptism today, and that would be Andrew Smith and Mackenzie Passion. So we're looking forward to that. I've mentioned to you on a number of occasions because it's been such a fascinating introduction. I mean, I love history, but I've never really been fascinated by Roman history. Because, I mean, there's a lot of debauchery, there's a lot of craziness in that history. And I mean, emperors who were really crazy. But it's really important to have that understanding because of the time that we're in right now, studying the book of Acts, and also because of First Peter is happening near this same time period. Now, it's not happening at the exact same year that this is happening, but it's all within the same time period. Just for a little bit of background, some years before, there was a, uh, they called him Little Little Caligula. It's his name, and he became an emperor as a young man, and it's clearly determined by historians of every flavor that he was just insane became that way uh, we couldn't begin to tell about his reign nor his lifestyle after that an older man took over as the emperor of Rome and that was Claudius and he was an older man and he managed to stay in power for a number of years though he too finally died a, an intentional death as he was poisoned by his own family members. <clears throat> and then there was a lot of maneuvering around and the infamous Nero came to the throne. And again, Nero was just crazy. I mean, the things he did were incredible. To let you know the kind of corruption that was happening here, there was a story told by this historian that I'm reading concerning Nero, and it was that uh, uh, somebody had accidentally hit Nero in the face. Nero and his young friends, now here he is, the, the Lord of the Earth, nearly all of it, the Caesar of Rome, and at night, he and his young friends were running as a gang and beating up people and stealing things and killing people simply for the thrill of it. While they were out one night, late night, one night, a senator was also out with his wife. His wife was being bounced around and threatened with all kinds of harm by this gang. Being a good husband, he fought for the honor of his wife. In fact, he grabbed a hold of one guy and punched him a number of times in the face. In the dark, they were wrestling around, and he grabbed him by his hair, and when he did, the wig came off, and he realized that he was fighting with none other than the emperor of Rome. He was shocked and let go of him, of course, did not say a word to anybody, went to a trusted fellow senator and said, I can't believe it, and he explained what happened. His friend told him, don't say a word. If you apologize for hitting the emperor, then his secret will be known. So don't say a word. Well, the more he thought of it, the more this senator was, was fearful for the well-being of his family. So he wrote a note and sent it to the emperor, a private correspondence and said, I am so sorry, I am the one who hit you the other night. If I had known it was you, I would never have laid a hand on you, Caesar. And Nero, as a 19-year-old, said, I have proof here that he assaulted his Caesar, his emperor. They brought him in. He was told that if he wanted to save the life of his family, that he would need to go and commit suicide. And then Nero took all of his possessions. That's the kind of man that is ruling the world now. And Paul has finished his three missionary journeys. Perhaps he wanted more, but this situation will absolutely change not only the physical direction of 
Paul's life, but it will change everything about Paul. Because from this point of the story onward, he will be forever in chains. There's so much in the story that it would do the story injustice because it's a great one to read. So I'm going to read it to you. You'll see it up on there. And I'm using a format that uses the story in the, in the dialogue. And we're talking about sharing our testimony. That's what we'll see Paul do in the very first part of our story. And that's the reason the title is, Do You Swear to Tell the Truth, the Whole Truth, and, of course we all know, nothing but the truth. That is what we are called to do. That's what the Great Commission is all about. The Great Commission is simply, we go out and we tell our story. When I was talking to our two young people who are getting baptized, their story is the best of stories. They were raised in solid, biblical, faithful Christian families. They have been taught the Word of God from their earliest memories. They have been encouraged to live a life of faith. That is the very best of testimonies. It has been their decision, as we'll hear during the next hour, that they want to show the world publicly that their profession of faith is legitimate, it's real, it's serious. Your story might not be that good. It might be that your story involves walking through the wilderness and being beat up by this world kicked around by sin and shame and its penalty and its consequences. But all of our stories are the same in this. Our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ changes everything. It not only changes where we are going, but it changes who we are. So, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let me read to you just a couple of words here that Peter will write Later on, we'll see him as we study during the, the second hour in a couple of months. But in writing to these people who are scattered all about, he says, Now who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you, about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. Do this, but do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed because they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Remember, it is better to suffer for doing good if that is what God wants than to suffer for doing wrong. So in telling your story, remember the who, what, when, where, how, and why. But before we get to those places, let's start with the story. If you look up there, you'll be able to tell who the speakers are. I'm not going to introduce each one. But we'll start off with Paul, and much of the time the narrator fills in the blanks for us. This comes right out of the scriptures. It's just reformatted for this kind of storytelling. Brothers and fathers, please let me defend myself against these charges. If you'll remember, Paul has come back to Jerusalem, and the leaders there said, Paul, there's a lot of controversy here in the city. A lot of people think that you're teaching that the law is no longer important, that, that Judaism is no longer important. And Paul says, no, I haven't taught that. What I've taught is Christ is the fulfillment of the Old Testament law. Now we have the power within us, the power of God, that enables us to live out the expectations of the law. But it's always been a confusing thing. The Jews were fickle during this time, worried about anybody that might change their traditions, not properly understand the scriptures, that was not their concern. Changing their traditions was their greater concern. 
So they've jumped on Paul. They've arrested Paul, or at least they've confronted Paul. In fact, their intention is to do him great harm, even to kill him. They've accused him of bringing a Gentile into the inner court. And that was a death penalty uh, charge on the part of the Jewish people. Though they were not able to carry out the death penalty, that's why the Romans were involved with the crucifixion of Christ. Nonetheless, when a mob goes crazy, they can do all kinds of horrible things. And it's obvious by our story that their intention is to kill Paul. So Paul grabs their attention. Brothers and fathers, please let me defend myself against these charges. When they heard him speaking Aramaic, a hush came over in the crowd. He's speaking their language. I am a Jew born in Tarsus, Sicilia. I was raised here in Jerusalem and was tutored in the great school of Gamaliel. Uh, uh, My education trained me in the strictest interpretation of the law of our ancestors. And I grew zealous for God. Just as all of you are today, I encountered a movement known as the Way, and I considered it a threat to our religion. So I persecuted it violently. I put both men and women in chains and had them in prison and would have killed them, as the high priest and the entire council of elders will tell you. I received documentation from them to go to Damascus and to work with the brothers there to arrest the followers of the way and bring them back to Jerusalem in chains so they could be properly punished. I was on my way to Damascus. It was about noon. Suddenly a powerful light shone around me and I fell to the ground. A voice spoke, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? I answered, who are you, Lord? And the voice replied, I am Jesus of Nazareth, the one you persecute. My companions saw the light, but they didn't hear the voice. I asked, what do you want me to do, Lord? The Lord replied, get up and go to Damascus, where he will be given your instructions there. Since the intense light had blinded me, my companions led me by the hand into Damascus. I was visited there by a devout man named Ananias, a law-keeping Jew who was well spoken of by all the Jews living in Damascus. He said, Brother Saul, regain your sight. I could immediately see again, beginning with Ananias standing before me. Then he said, You have been chosen by God, the God of our ancestors, to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear the voice of God. If you will tell the story of what you have seen and heard to the whole world, so now don't delay, get up, be ceremonial, ceremonially cleansed through baptism, and have your sins washed away as you call on his name in prayer. I return to Jerusalem. And I was praying there in the temple one day. I slipped into a trance and had a vision in which Jesus said to me, Hurry, get out of Jerusalem fast. The people here will not receive your testimony about me. I replied, But Lord, they all know that I went from the synagogue to synagogue imprisoning and beating everyone who believed in you. They know what I was like and how I stood in approval of the execution of Stephen, your witness when he was stoned. I even held the coats of those who actually stoned him. Jesus replied, Go, for I am going to send you to a distant lands to teach the outsiders, the Gentiles. These Jewish leaders are prepared to squabble with Paul about the law, but when he mentions the Gentiles, how that Paul was giving a gospel message, a message from God to the Gentiles, they went crazy. They were listening quietly until he mentioned the outsiders. Away with him, 
Such a man can't be allowed to remain here. Kill him. He must die. Chaos broke out again. People were shouting, slamming their coats down on the ground, and throwing fistful of dust up in the air. The commandant ordered the soldiers to bring Paul to the barracks and flog him until he confessed to whatever he had done to stir up this outrage. Now, part of the reason for that, perhaps, is the Roman soldiers would not have understood this very emotional and energetic conversation and testimony in Aramaic. That was the language of the Jews. So here, this commander, all he sees is that a riot is beginning to start. People are shouting and screaming about all the terrible things uh, that are going to happen. So he snatches Paul and his estimation, another rebel rousing Jew. He's going to take him back and whip him with that cat of nine whip. The one that had the, the leather straps. Each little string tied to a piece of broken glass or metal or stone. And then when they were whipped, it would grab the skin and just rip it and shred it with every, with every strike. And this Roman leader in charge of, of a law and order says, I'll get the message out of him. I'll know for sure what he's saying. And he'd better explain it right away or we'll give him the full 39 lashes. So back at the barracks, as they tied him up with leather thongs, Paul spoke to a nearby officer. Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen without a trial? Now that was Paul's trump card. Roman citizens had a, a highly valued position in the entire world. If you were lucky, you were simply born a Roman. That's Paul's story. His parents must have purchased the citizenship or must have gained it through some deed that was, was really recognized as valuable by the Roman government because they would extend citizenship as a reward for gallant service. Probably they bought the Roman citizenship. But either way, Paul has it by birth. The officer went and spoke to the commandant. What can you do about this? Did you know this fellow is a Roman citizen? The commandant rushes to Paul's side. What's this? Are you really a Roman citizen? Yes. I paid a small fortune for my citizenship. I was born a citizen. Hearing this, those who were about to start the flogging pulled back, and the commandant was concerned because he was arrested. He had arrested and bound a citizen without charge. He still needed to, come to conduct an investigation to uncover the Jews' accusations against Paul. So the next day, he removed the ties on Paul and called a meeting before the chief priest and council and elders. He brought Paul in and had him stand before the group. Hearing this, the crowd is very interested in what's going on. So we start with, Paul stared at the council and spoke. Brothers, I've always lived my life to this very day with a clear conscience before God. Ananias, the high priest, signaled those standing near Paul to hit him on the mouth. You hypocrite. God will slap you. How dare you sit in judgment and claim to represent the law while you violate the law by ordering me slapped for no reason. It's interesting. Paul would have known better to speak in such a way to the high priest. Some have suggested, you know, that Paul may have had that thorn in the flesh being a vision problem. And even though he was looking intently and all that was happening around him, maybe he didn't really see who it was. Or maybe he said, since you're not acting like a high priest, I'm not going to treat you like one. There's some debate there. But we go along with the story. The bystanders say, the nerve of you insulting the high priest of God. I'm 
sorry, my brothers. I didn't realize this was the high priest. The law warns us not to curse the ruler of the people. Paul noticed that some members of the councils, council were Sadducees and some were Pharisees. So he quickly spoke to the council. Paul, having been a part of this council, he knew there was always a debate happening, either publicly at their meetings or privately at their social get-togethers, always arguing about who was right, the Pharisees or the Sadducees. The Pharisees believed in the law, so did the Sadducees, but the Sadducees really did not believe in everlasting life. They didn't believe in anything beyond this time. So there's always this great conflict going on. So these leaders, uh, so that got the two, uh, I'm sorry, up here. Brothers, I'm a Pharisee, born a Pharisee. I'm on trial because I have hope that the dead are raised. That got the two parties arguing with each other because the Sadducees say there's no such thing as resurrection heavenly messengers or spirits, and the Pharisees believe in all three. Soon these leaders were shouting, and some of the scholars from the party of the Pharisees rose up on their feet. There's nothing wrong with this man. Maybe he has really encountered a spirit or a heavenly messenger. The two parties were about to start throwing punches, and the commandant was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces. So he sent his soldiers to intervene. They took Paul back into custody and returned him to the barracks. That night, the Lord came near and spoke to him. Keep up your courage, Paul. You have successfully told your story about me in Jerusalem, and soon you will do the same in Rome. That morning, a group of more than 40 Jewish opponents conspired to cure, kill Paul. They bound themselves with, by an oath that they wouldn't eat or drink until he was dead. They told the chief priests and elders of their plan. We've made an oath not to eat or drink until this man is dead. So you and the council must ask the commandant to bring Paul to meet with you. Tell him that you want to further investigate Paul's case. We'll get rid of the troublemaker on his way here. Now Paul had a nephew that heard about the planned ambush. He managed to gain entry into the barracks and alerted Paul. Paul called one of the officers. Take this young man to the commandant. He has news the commandant needs to hear. The officer took him to the commandant. The prisoner named Paul asked me to bring this man to you. He has some kind of information. The commandant led him away so that they could speak in private. What do you want to tell me? The Jewish council is going to ask you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow under the pretext that there will be a thorough investigation. But don't agree to do it because 40 assassins have bound themselves to an oath not to eat or drink until they've killed Paul. Their plan is in motion, and they're simply waiting for you to play your part. The commandant sent the young man home with these instructions. Don't tell a soul that you've spoken with me. Then he called for two officers. At nine o'clock tonight, you will leave for Caesarea with 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen. Have a mount for Paul to ride and conduct him safely to Felix, the governor. He wrote the following letter. Commandant Claudius Lysesus greets His Excellency Felix, governor. The accompanying prisoner was seized by his Jews who were about to kill him. I learned he was a Roman citizen and intervened with the guard here to protect him. I arranged for a hearing before their council and learned that he was accused for reasons relating to their religious law, but that he had done nothing deserving the imprisonment or execution. I was informed that a group was planning to assassinate him, so I sent him to you immediately. I will require his accusers to present their complaint before you. 
So the soldiers followed their orders and safely conducted Paul as far as that Paracus that night. The next day, the horsemen conducted him on to Caesarea as the foot soldiers returned to the barracks. The horsemen delivered the letter and the prisoner to Felix, who read the letter. The only question Felix asked concerned the province of Paul's birth. When he learned Paul was from Cilicia, he said, As soon as your accusers arrive, I will hear your case. He placed Paul under guard within Herod's headquarters. Now you can see how important the Roman citizenship was. Because when they decided to conduct Paul out of the city, they literally set a small army to protect him. This is a major change in the history, not only of the gospel, not only for Jerusalem, but this is a turning point in history for the entire world. Because now Paul is going to Rome. We have just a few minutes, and I've switched the order around a little bit. Would you take your notes out and, and look at them? You'll notice there are no really blanks to fill in. It simply outlines what I've read to you. Paul stands before an angry mob, and he gives his testimony. Paul stands before the Roman military, and then Paul stands before the Sanhedrin. But the part in the middle is the most important part of the message today. One, you need to be able to write it with confidence. So if you grab a pen, I'm going to ask you to write. You can scoot over or cover your paper. No one's trying to find out any hidden information about you. But when we watched Paul as we were reading his story, he did what we have been told to do and told to be prepared to do time and time again. He simply said, this is what life was like before I met Christ. This is who I was. This is where I lived. This is what I did. This is what I believed. And then I met Jesus Christ. And it changed everything in my life. Not only the destination of my soul, but it changed everything else about my life. The unseen hand of God has been leading me this way or that, occasionally pushing me this way or that, depending on my obedience. And then he goes on and he talks about, and this is what life has been like since the day I met Christ. Remember Peter was telling these Christians in Rome who are being punished unjustly, persecuted, violently. He says, just keep doing the right thing. Live your life with the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord of your life, and then be prepared to tell your story. It doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be involved. No one else will see it, but what you do is simply raise your hand, and you say, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I want to give you a couple of minutes to do that. Why don't you take about 30 seconds and write two sentences about my life before Christ. And then we're going to pray that the Lord will give you an opportunity to share your testimony this week. So you need to be prepared, Peter says. Two sentences, my life before Christ. might have to be in shorthand because you may not be able to put all of the details in there, but just sketch out in two sentences at least the main idea of how and when I met Christ. How and when I met Christ. And I know I'm 
hurry to move along, but let us see. Just two sentences to mark the highlight. Something that you can hang the rest of your thoughts on. Changes in my life since I met Christ. If you were not able, I know some of you didn't write for a number of reasons, so I'm not looking at you for anything like that. But if you were not able to fill that out because it's never really happened, you've always been supportive of Christ. You've always honored Him. You've always recognized that He, he is God's Son. But unless there's been a time when you have said, I come and confess my sin and I ask my Heavenly Father to forgive me because of what Christ did on my behalf. I place my faith in Christ and the finished work of His salvation. And unless you've done that, then today is the right day to do that. To be certain that today you know your faith is in Christ. But if you're a Christian, and if you're like the rest of us, and you're a coward, because almost all the Christians I know, and I've been one for a long time, and indeed I have been the coward myself. Can I tell you, it's easy to tell the gospel up here. It's hard to tell the gospel one-on-one -on -one with somebody. But we need to be ready. Paul was in a very violent and the emotional and a chaotic situation. But when the Lord gave him an opportunity to speak, the very first thing he said was, let me tell you my story. This is what I was like, and then I met Christ, and this is how my life has been changed. That is the best story. That's the best information you can give to your friend, family, or your friends. Remember when Jesus said these words to his disciples? And when you are brought to trial in the synagogues and before rulers and authorities, don't worry about how to defend yourself or what to say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what needs to be said. Though that was given to the disciples, I believe by way of application, we can claim that promise for this very week. Lord, if you give me the opportunity, and if you give me the words, I am committing right now to share the gospel. My story. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And we close your eyes and bow your heads. I'll give you a second to speak of that to the Lord. Father, we are so pleased to see these kinds of practical examples. Lord, even if Paul was not in the right place at the right time when he came to Jerusalem, we can see that you clearly stepped right into his life at this critical moment and you gave him the words to say. You provided all of the right people in all of the right places to protect one of your own, to lead him to his next appointment for ministry. Father, I know that you do the same for us. That you take us places we don't plan to go. We bump into people that we never anticipated seeing. And Lord, we know that in many of those cases, it's because our next appointment for ministry is to share our testimony. Father, it's my prayer that this week that you'll, you'll be able to listen to your children tell that great story time and time again. And Lord, we need to know that you are doing the work in us and through us. And that's why we come praying in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
thank you so much for your patience and listening to that being read. It was such a great story. I wanted to share it all with you. Thank you. God bless you.